as our, our final speaker, the last, it, it's very fitting, wait. it's very fitting that we have as our last act of our AZM uh, assembly here, um, Ambassador Tom Nides, a former ambassador, but I'll call him ambassador, um, because when we met in Jerusalem at the end of April uh, at the Extraordinary Zionist Congress, uh, the last speaker was Tom Nides. Um, and everyone actually was a tribute to you then because the, the Congress ended an hour early and everyone could have left, but they stayed behind on a Friday uh, to hear you. Um, so it was a very different Jewish world, very different Israel when you spoke to us um, in, in the end of April, a time of turmoil and, and division. Now we're in a very different place um, and we, we welcome you here. Ambassador Nides finished in the summer. We heard from Ambassador Liu on video last night um, and joined the, he'll tell you more, joined uh, the private sector about a month or two ago uh, at, at Wells Fargo, uh, am I correct? And then a few weeks ago said he was going to come here and, and work with the Jewish community, including in this building at UJA. So we are welcome, we're happy to have this opportunity to have you here. And one thing that I must thank you for, it was mentioned earlier, is about uh, the visa waiver program that many of you uh, all supported. <laughs> and it was Ambassador Nide's final act to get that done. And that has greatly, as you heard from several people, enabled Israeli families and others to come here to America. So we thank you for your work on getting that uh, accomplished and welcome Tom Nides. Well, uh, well, are we not living in uh, complicated times? Um, let me just mention a thing about the, the visa waiver program. I got a, I got a text this morning, actually. Um, as, as you probably know, I um, this was some reason for some reason. I, this is like a, I think Howard Core called me, like the week after I became nominated. He says, "The only thing I want you to do is get this thing called the visa waiver done." I said, "Oh, is that all?" Um, and I had no idea what I was getting myself into, and that started about two and a half years ago, this uh, journey to try to get it done. And um, you guys helped me a lot try to get this done. And I, and I did it because I felt, number one, um, Israel should be treated like an ally. <laughs> like when you look around Europe and you don't have to stand in lines to get a visa, this is Israel. Israel, the Jewish people should have the ability to come to the United States without the hassle of standing in line and the long and turnable lines that it took to get a visa. And through a lot of work, a lot of pushing, a lot of shoving, um, uh, we got it done. And I got an email um, this morning saying, um, Mr. Nides, um, I want to tell you uh, just one last time, my family really wanted to come to the United States. And we weren't afraid we could do it because we wanted to see my grandmother, and we didn't need a visa. I just want to tell you how much I appreciate that. Okay. And you know, I, you know, again, I, it's, it's the little things, but I think ultimately um, um, time means everything, because I assure you, we probably wouldn't get none now. Uh, and we got it done, and I think for a long time it'll be proven to be one of the most important things we got accomplished, uh, certainly in my tenure as ambassador. Um, I'm glad you heard from Jack. He's going to do a spectacular job. Um, uh, you should clap for it because he's going to be a uh, uh, Jack. Uh, just in a, in a moment of honesty, Jack and I switched jobs, as you may know. Some of us, you may know. I was I replaced Jack as Deputy Secretary of State under Secretary Clinton, and so isn't this cool? Now he's replacing me. Now he had a couple of the cooler jobs. He was also Chief of Staff and Treasury Secretary. Uh, so he is. Um, uh, I don't think he had ever thought that he was going to be a wartime ambassador, but there's probably no one who's better suited to do that than uh, Jack Liu, uh, beyond his intelligence, his commitment to the state of Israel, and his stature, I think will uh, buoyed very well for America's representation. So I'm honored that he's my friend and he got uh, sworn in just last week, uh, miraculously quickly, and he's now on the ground. And I hope to be in Israel on the 1st of December and be able to see him. So uh, yeah, I'd like to say he has big shoes to fill, but that would be a mistake. <laughs> David Friedman's not here, so I can say that. Um, OK. Um, uh, I believe, um, 
I believe this is going to be, and I've said this publicly many times, I believe this next 30 days are going to be this most, some of the most important 30 days in the history of the Jewish state. And I say that not without um, any bit of hyperbole, but in reality. Because Israel is going to try to do something that's um, really difficult. They're going to, try to, to actually try to do four things simultaneously that are all in contradictions to each other. And that's hard. Number one, they have no choice than to rid Gaza of Hamas. This is, this is, not, this is not option. This is not an option. This is not, um, should, it, should it not be? No. Uh, Israel must, must rid Gaza and the threat of, of uh, I mean, Hamas in Gaza, the threat it has and poses upon the state of Israel. And um, that is not going to be simple. We can all decide w the definition of what success and rid of. Um, it's an ideology, so it's not simple. You're not going to wake up one day and Hamas is no longer going to exist. Uh, but they can do what they can do is they can get rid of the leadership. They can just completely destroy the infrastructure. They can make the threat of Hamas uh, go away. But Israel must do that and, and must do it as quickly as possible. Because it's imperative that it sends a message to all the other people around the neighborhood who now think somehow that Israel is weak. And they got to prove to those people that Israel is, of course, not weak. So number one, they have, as Joe Biden says, they have no choice than to do that. Number two, they got to figure a way to save the lives of these 240 hostages. You know, it's sick what these people did. Grabbing babies and grandmothers and grandfathers and obviously 100 plus soldiers and it's barbaric. Uh, it's barbaric. And um, sadly that runs con somewhat contrary or contradiction to ridding Gaza of Hamas because we assume, and I've been, I'm talking to some of the families again this afternoon, I'm sure many of you have talked to the families, but as they decide that they need to do what they need to do, I'm sure some of these uh, hostages are in these tunnels. So it's very complicated for Israel to, to basically destroy Hamas and save the lives of these innocent bystanders. Number three, they got to keep Hezbollah out of this. Make no mistake, those of you, and I think most of you have all been in Israel, um, Israel does not need or does not desire to have a two-front war. And they need to do everything they can to keep Hezbollah out. And to be clear, this is not a political statement, but thank God for Joe Biden. Because I'm telling you something, folks. Those big ships that are sitting in the Mediterranean that are pointing towards uh, Lebanon and Iran, the Iranians are taking note. And when Joe Biden says superpowers don't bluff, he means it. And I don't care if you voted for Trump or you like Trump. Or it, it's irrelevant to me. This is not about politics. I could care less. Although, I wish you'd vote for Biden. But put that aside for a minute. It's irrelevant. Okay? One of the benefits of Joe Biden being so old, he gets it. He gets it. No, he gets it. And, and I'm telling you, when he got off that plane in July of last year with me at the tarmac, and he walked from the airplane at 3 o'clock in the afternoon at Ben Gurion Airport. He walked onto the podium and he looked at the cameras and said, you do not need to be a Jew to be a Zionist. He meant it. And, it's, and you're seeing that right now. He is driving this policy. Do be clear, folks. There's a lot of pressure on this guy. There's a lot of pressure on Joe Biden to soften, to move. To, and Joe Biden has staken a position... It supports not only has Israel's back, but sends a very strong message to Hezbollah and Iran, don't screw with us. And that's very important. Lastly, Israel needs to do whatever they can to save innocent lives, including those Palestinians who are just innocent bystanders, which runs completely contrary to the last first three things I just said. It's hard. None of us like these pictures. Pictures of babies being killed, or, or, but you know, Hamas is using these people as human shields. They're putting them in hospitals, they're making them not go from the north to the south so they, can, so they can be killed. But to be clear, Israel has an obligation, as best as they can, to try to protect as many innocent Palestinian lives as possible. 
And that, my friend, is very difficult. And as I like to say, um, you know, this is, as we all know, what's going on now is a race against time. They don't, Israel does not have indefinite amount of time. They know it. We all know it. The world community knows it. Now, I should say they have more time than people expect them to have because ultimately they'll do what they need to do. And certainly this, this effort on the ground will be uh, way more impressive if they can, they can last a longer time to be able to do the things they need to do. But they don't have indefinite amount of time. But I am confident this, the government and the people of Israel will demand it that they rid Gaza of Hamas and the threat. You know, when you have 200,000 displaced Israelis from the south and from the north, these Israelis want to go back to their homes. And they can't go back to their homes until they feel a sense of safety on the borders. And that's, that's the responsibility of this government and the United States to help that occur. So I, um, you know, I've been thinking about a little bit um, when you guys asked me to come here about kind of my reflection as ambassador and you know what I learned and what I didn't learn. You know, it's it's all kind of mute now that what is going on. It's not really about me or what I thought of. But I said to uh, someone this morning, I was at some uh, private equity firm. They were asking about what's going on with the anti-Semitism, and am I worried about it? I said, hello, yes, I'm worried about it. Um, and I've said this, and I think many of you may have heard me when I spoke to you uh, in Israel. What's going on in college campuses is something all of us should be aware of. Most of us have kids or grandkids or friends or family. And this is not just for you know, religious Jews or non-religious Jews or non-Jews. It's a serious problem. And I said two and a half years ago, Spending our time chasing the AOCs around is fine. Whatever people want to do, that's up to them. But you can win the battle and lose the war. And we better get our act together of what's going on in college campuses today. Okay? We need to be focused like a laser about how we're communicating on college campuses, what's going on on college campuses, how do we change it. We're Jews. We can figure this out. We need to figure out how we get our money together and our organization together and figure out how we change the narrative. I said this literally two years ago in my first speech. I said we should be doing a moonshot program for college campuses. We should basically take four college campuses, one in the east, west, north, and south, spend $50 million, do all the work you would do, which is both focus group and polling, and figure out which programs work on college campuses, what moves these kids including what Israel says on social media, what we do is that maybe we do need to have more Hillel houses. Maybe we need to have less. Maybe we need to bring more black kids to Israel. Maybe we need to bring less. I have no idea, but what I'm telling you, I watch it with my own kids, and they're being indoctrinated about this. And you, by the way, just to be clear, you can be pro-Palestinian. I have no problem with that. But do not cross the line. You can be pro-Palestinian. I, I say it all the time, I was, I was the ambassador of the state of Israel. I said, I'm pro-Israel and pro-Palestinian people. Not the PA, not the PLO, but the people. The men and women who live in the West Bank and Gaza. That's, that, that to me is important. And that message gets lost. And when people say stupid crap like the, you know, the river to the sea, we got we to gotta, we gotta clamp down and push out and make sure these kids understand what they're saying and what they're doing. But that takes energy, and we need to focus. When, the, when we get over this period of time, we need to focus what's going on. Because I'm telling you, this is as serious an issue that we possibly have. Because you could wake up five years from now and have 200 members of Congress who feel this way. Okay, Not a handful who basically articulate some views. You could have 200. So we got to get our act together. That was one lesson I had. Second, um, this is a wake-up call for all of us. You know, most of you in here are, are probably more conservative than I am. Certainly many of you are more religious than I am. But this is about get, waking people up. The Reformed Jews, the liberal Jews, the conservative Jews, and yes, even the Orthodox Jews, waking people up to realize you've got to get involved. It's not just good enough, you know, to go to your shul and to be involved in the UJA. Okay? you got to get in the middle of it. And it, you're seeing that right now. The, you're waking people up. You're waking Jews up, not only here in the United States, but in Europe 
in Latin America, you're waking people up to realize we've got to like push back. We've got to understand what's going on because it's imperative that all of us understand that. And we've got to think about ways to communicate in a different way. My, um, I've had a lot of really uh, fortunate times, and one of the fortunate things was being able to be the, the American ambassador to Israel. How cool is that? You know, I, I, I've, you've heard me say a thousand times, I'm a little reformed Jew from Duluth, Minnesota, okay? My parents were, uh, my dad was the uh, president of UJA, my mother was a head of sisterhood in Hadassah, right? You know, I wasn't, um, you know, I was bar mitzvah. I went for my first time to Israel at 13 years old on a nafti trip, Northern Federation of Temple Youth, okay? And, uh, and I came, uh, so I came at this uh, naturally about getting involved. Getting involved. That's what I really wanted to be. That was the message. I wanted to get in the game. And so I spent half my career in government, half my career in business, but I, I got in the game and, and took some risks. And coming to Israel and being the American ambassador to Israel is one's highest honor because we are Israel's most important ally. Make no mistake about that. And that guy, Shickley, who was the minister of diaspora affairs when he, one day when I was going after them for the uh, judicial reform, he said, you know, tell the ambassador to mind his own business. And my, and my well, this is exactly what I wanted to applaud. But, <laughs> and I, my, respo my response to Minister Shickley, it's the same as it was now, probably a little bit more poignant today now. Do you really want the United States to mind their own business? Because it's proven. It's proven it's important. Our business is Israel's business. And we're here to support the state of Israel and the security of the Israel people to make sure that Israel celebrates another 75 years of peace and prosperity. Thank you very much. So we have reached the end of our biennial, um, and as we always do, we will sing Hatikva together at the end, but before we do that, I just want really to thank all of you for being here. Um, it was really, really important, I felt, for us to be together. I, it was very um, heartening and enlightening for me to see all of you here. I really hope that we are going to make this more of a habit and we'll see each other more often in person. Um, and this is really just a start of our next term. We, we have a lot of work to do together for the Jewish community as a whole. All right, where is that? Okay, we're, we're all going to start. On the count of three, we're all going to start at Tikva. One, Achat, Shalosh. Kolot Balei